Hi, my name is Jesse Anderson. I'm here to talk a little bit about my latest project. It's called uh, Million Monkey Project. You might have heard about it in any number of sources. Uh, Slashdot covered it, BBC, CNN, there's a lot of ones. So what I wanted to do now is talk in much more technical detail than I did in a previous video about how the Million Monkey Project works. So the Million Monkey Project uses a technology called Hadoop. And Hadoop is an open source implementation of Google, uh, a paper written by the Google founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin. And this open source project was created by Doug Cutting. And this is what the monkeys are using to do the distributed nature of the, of the work that they're doing. So in, um, when Google was founded, you might remember if you used the internet back then that Google was significantly ahead of Yahoo at that time. If you remember the speed difference between a Yahoo search and a uh, Google search and a Yahoo search was very significant. And that was one of the things that made Google Google at that time. And the way that Google did this was using a technology called MapReduce. MapReduce was a paper that, as I mentioned, Larry Page and Sergey Brin wrote about. And that allowed them to create a distributed system and distribute load evenly across an entire cr cluster, and, they did, and that worked very efficiently. So MapReduce takes a problem, in, in this case a search, and it searches the entire web simultaneously across n number of computers. So a portion of that is done on this computer, a portion on this, a portion on that, across the entire cluster. And that was very big, that was very important because that allowed Google to use basically commodity, beige box computers, whatever kind of computer that they wanted. They didn't need a supercomputer doing the, the searching. They were spreading that load across very, very low, moderately priced computers. And then they created a different, another thing that is needed for this type of application, and that was called Google File System. Google File System is a distributed file system that allows uh, any computer on the cluster to access a file. So if you, you remember back in the day, there weren't terabyte computer, uh, hard drives just lying around and for 50 bucks. So what they had to do is they, they would load up a, a single computer and they would spread that, that data around using a distributed file system. So 500 gigabytes here on this computer plus 500 gigabytes plus five, all the way down were all conglomerated together into one big file system that could be petabytes because they had a distributed file system. So in order to maintain redundancy and not to have a single computer take the entire cluster down, they would create redundancy. And that redundancy could be used, could be set up when you initialize the, the, the file system. And that was very important at that time because even, even the web at that time was huge, much bigger than a single computer could ever try to, to have on its hard drive. Using that distributed file system, it could actually take that data and have it in the entire file system accessible to any computer on the cluster. So as I mentioned, Doug Cutting, the, the guy who created Hadoop, took these two programs and created open source implementations in Java using them. He created a Hadoop version of MapReduce, written in Java once more, and then he created a distributed file system, DFS, and for Hadoop. And both of those are used by the Monkey project. So in the case of the Google file system, the, the Bloom filter file is in the distributed file system. We'll talk a little bit more about the Bloom field or Bloom filter in a second. And the, the output, the actual hits that are found within the, the file are put in that distributed file system. So let's talk in more detail about how the Monkey Project uses MapReduce. We'll start out with the map. So the map's job is to take this huge amount of data and figure out what's relevant, which is passed to the, to the Reduce, which narrows it down even further. So the, what the monkeys do is the first pass of the map is taking a pseudo-random number generated uh, group of bytes and saying this is nine characters, and nine characters in this case, of Shakespeare. And that pseudo-random number generator just outputs that continuously, and it's set. And that's passed then to a Bloom filter. 
excuse me, the, the pseudo rounded number generator is a Mersine twister. I needed, that was one of the big things that I needed. I needed uh, certain parts of the, of the monkey project are used very, very heavily. The pseudo random number generator and the checks are 99, 98% of what the monkey project is as far as CPU time. So that had to be incredibly efficient. And I spent a lot of time actually working on which it, how to make those more efficient. So the Mersine Twister is one of them. The next big one, and in my opinion the biggest part, uh, it actually did reduce the amount of CPU usage by about 20 to 30 percent just by changing the how I check the data and that was using a bloom field or a bloom filter so the, the way a bloom field works is it hashes data so you create a file with various indexes at various offsets and that file actually is is saved so that I'm not generating it each time so a nine character set comes in, the Bloomfield creates its hash and actually does a check to see if the file or those nine characters are anywhere in Shakespeare. And that's very important and, and, and it's very easy to do because the, that's what a Bloom filter is made for. So a Bloom filter will never give a false negative but can give false positives. What that means is if the Bloom filter says it's not there, it's really not there. But if a bloom filter says it's there, there's still some doubt as to whether it could be there because you could be experiencing a false positive. So when you're creating a bloom filter, you need to set up, you need to do some calculations. I can deal with this many false positives and this many, um, and, but I, and your trade-off is memory. So you can have tons of memory usage or you can have a small bloom filter with lots of with more false positives or much more memory with fewer false positives. That's your trade-off. Uh, you do have a, a little bit of a trade-off of CPU usage with the number of hashes that you want to do. So that bloom field is the that bloom filter is the next part of what the uh, of the map. That's the last part of the map. It's after it passes that bloom filter, it's considered uh, part of the uh, passed on to the reduce. So in the reduce, there it, it's running a very basic string uh, index of. So it's taking that nine character uh, group and seeing if in any work of Shakespeare does that even appear. And that's it. Uh, and it iterates through that, through each work of Shakespeare to see where in each work of Shakespeare was that character group found. And that's uh, in a very basic way, in a, in a very technical way actually, uh, how the, the monkey project is using Hadoop and various things. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the comments that I get. Uh, and so I'd like to mention, I do understand what infinite monkey theorem is. Uh, I do know what infinity is. I realize that this project does not have an infinite amount of resources. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out how can I create a, a, a result without actually having an infinite number of resources. And this is what I did. This is how I figured out how to do it. Um, using nine characters, which is why I did nine characters. I actually calculated out and thought, I have, I want to do this project in about a, a month or two. And so I ran the numbers, ran the math to figure that out. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to look, watch this video. And uh, keep checking back because the monkeys haven't finished the rest of the works of Shakespeare.